record. Apologies for that. That's and fine. now, uh, Janika, over to you again. Yeah. So, yeah, so I um, had a relationship of um, nearly six years with my ex-partner. Um, and the relationship, I didn't realise at the time, was an abusive relationship. So it started with him being quite um, paranoid, jealous, and could see he was quite had an aggressive nature. I think growing up in the inner city, around the people I was around, I just thought I just normalised that as being normal behaviour. But then there was two different violent instances which I finished the relationship, and it was apart from them for six months, and then we bumped into each other again, and he was getting counselling and getting help, and we entered back into a relationship, and I'd made that boundary of you know that's not something that I would ever accept, and I'd always been surrounded by domestic violence in my friends, mum's relate, mum and dad's relationships, some of my own family members, and it's something I'd always prided myself that I would never accept. Um, and then there wasn't no physical violence. So to me, that was it, you know, I was took that, I took that stand and that was it. But what took place instead, which I didn't realise, because I'd always seen physical violence as being domestic violence, and obviously it's called domestic abuse now, and I was never educated really on domestic abuse is that he was very verbally abusive, mentally and emotionally abusive, still very paranoid, still very jealous, but because I always kind of put my foot down, I thought, you know, I was just in control of it. So we went on to have, a, I had a daughter um, from a previous relationship when we entered into the relationship. And when it got to the end of the relationship of the six years, when I ended the relationship, we had a nine month old, my big daughter was 13 and I was nine weeks pregnant with our second child. And I ended the relationship because I felt like I drained my soul. I had nothing left to give. And I realised at that time I was definitely a rescuer and I felt like my love could heal him and that's what he needed. But then I'd got to the end and realised that this is draining my soul and I can't, there's nothing I can do to help him. I've got to let it go because I'm not going to have this kind of behaviour being taught to my children. So I'd ended the relationship and in four weeks of it ending, he'd done a Facebook hate post about me. He had phoned the police and said that I punched him in the back of his head when he was driving with my children in the car got arrested had to give a statement he gave his ex-partner my number and that she was threatening me so it was just a whole barrage of different horrible behaviors so he was also coming around my house every morning shouting abuse at my door wanting to come in and I, I just couldn't take it anymore so I got a non-molestation order on him and he couldn't come to my house, but we could meet in a public place, to see our daughter, and we could meet at his mum's house, to see his daughter. So I, the day we got the the day after we got the nomination order, I went on holiday, family holiday with the children, and my nan. He was supposed to come on. He was very upset that he couldn't come, but obviously I wasn't going to let him come to, on the holiday. Mm. And then the day that I got back, um, we'd had a conversation before we went, and he said, you know, can we just be friends? And there's, you know, I'm sorry, I'm going to get help. And I said, yeah, of course, we can be friends. You know, he's always been very loving towards our daughter. So when I came back, I had a barrage of abuse on my phone, and he was just begging and begging to see his daughter. He had some money that he owed me, and he said, can I just see you just for five minutes, literally five minutes, please? I'm really hurting. I just need to see how we can arrange to, you know, make an arrangement to see our daughter. I said, yeah, that's fine. I've literally got 15 minutes before I get my daughter from school. So I've pulled to, gone to a car park because it's within the restraints of the nomination order. Um, mm. It was a beautiful sunny day. It was July the 1st, 2013. Pulled into the car park. I've got my nine month old daughter strapped into the back in a car seat. And she fell asleep. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have to have a conversation with him now. And I didn't fear him physically. A lot of people, he was six foot three, he was built like a bodybuilder. And a lot of people said, gosh, aren't you scared of him? But I just saw a little confused boy that just wanted to be loved and wanted to be forgiven for his bad behavior. So I was more scared of his mouth because he would be not care to abuse me in front of everybody, verbally abuse me. So I was more scared of that. So I thought, if he starts, I'll just drive off. So I didn't have no concern about that. So I pulled into the car park, he was already there. And when I saw my daughter was asleep, I thought, oh, great. So I took my seat back off, took my sunglasses off, turned my music off, turned my car off and waited for him to get in because he was going to have a conversation. And as mm -hmm. he got into the car, he had the, like, something in you and literally got me into a headlock and was strangling me. 
So no. when they say that whole fight, flight, freeze comes into play, it really does. And I was thinking to myself, rationally, okay, what am I going to do here? Because I just couldn't believe this was happening to me. So I couldn't freeze because my daughter was strapped into the car seat. And I couldn't, I couldn't flee either because of the same mm. reason. Um, and this was actually happening. So I thought the only thing I've got left to do is fight. So I was screaming for help because I was on the car park of a gym that was actually a bodybuilder gym. And I'd seen men on the car park. So I thought if I just get out of the car, this will stop. So I managed mm. to get out of the car. I did scream for help. Somebody help me. He's got a knife. He's going to kill me. And I'm pregnant. And it was as if there's, there was three men in the car park at the time. as if somebody just pressed the pause button and they all just froze. And it was like it was in slow motion. I thought no one's going to help me. And I just had this knowing that no one was going to help me. So he literally walked around to my side of the car. So I'm kind of trapped in between my door and my car, a driver's mm. side, and lifted, lifted up his arm with the knife and said, I'm going to kill you now. And this is your fault because you don't want to be with me. And just proceeded to stab at me. So as he started to, as he pulled it down, I, I went for my face and I put my arm up and he stabbed me in my arm. So the knife went straight into my arm and he pulled it out. And it was so surreal because I really thought he's not going to do this. But as that happened, mm. I thought, OK, well, this is actually happening. And he just proceeded to stab me and stab me and stab me. And it felt like it went on forever. It was actually stab wounds were eight, but there was a lot of lacerations because obviously I was kicking and I was punching. And then somebody mm. shouted, we've called the police, please hold on. At that point, he stopped. He went to his car. I stood up. And he got in his car and drove off. And at there, there was 24 witnesses standing in a group together, crying, screaming on their phones. And I remember at first being so angry, like, why did nobody help me? Because to me, I've got all these people and I'm on my own. Mm -hmm. um, and I literally collapsed on the floor. Um, and I was awake, I was conscious. I remember looking at the sky and I'm a woman of faith. And I thought, my life can't end like this. Not at the hands of the man that I've loved for six years. And I had to get taken to hospital, had to leave my daughter there with strangers. And I knew I was being stabbed as many times as I had, obviously. And I just remember saying to them, can you just hurry up and stitch me up? I want to go home. Didn't realise until I woke up the next day in intensive care that I'd actually been stabbed in my heart. And I was actually dying at that time. So I'd woke up having had open heart life saving surgery. The heart surgeon came round to me and obviously I was in shock because I've never been good at biology and I thought your heart was in the middle and because mm -hmm. I kind of leant back it, it goes underneath your left breast and it stabbed mm -hmm. me underneath my breast so it gone straight into my heart and I said could I have died he said in 20 yeah. years I've been a heart surgeon he said I've never seen anyone survive injuries like that you should not be alive it's a miracle that you've survived so obviously that was very traumatic and as I was lying in intensive care that day with all my thoughts going round in my head he was on the run it was on the front of the local newspaper it was on the news I just was so overwhelmed with all this emotion and what I always say as an advantage of that happening to me at 31 is it always been secondary related to trauma so I'd seen what trauma had done to people and as I was lying there in that bed yeah. the thought that went through my head is I am a victim not a victim and there is mm. no way I'm going to allow his actions to ruin my life because I knew that this trauma was going to be huge to heal from so I was in hospital for four weeks I asked about my unborn child and said oh, it was just a fetus that no way that it would have survived really sorry you know I wouldn't be worrying about that now at least you're alive mm. and I felt very passionate about no don't say that you know this is my child and I was very passionate about it and it did survive my son did survive um mm -hmm. so I was very fortunate with that he was also a miracle bless him wow. um so I was in hospital for four weeks I came out I lost my home because I was privately renting I lost my job I lost my car because it happened in my car and the police kept it as evidence so I was homeless jobless carless Jesus. pregnant single mother three children well two children and pregnant I had to go and move into my mum's masonette in my childhood room box room mm. and I was just overwhelmed with where do I go forward now but what I did know I didn't know anything about restorative justice at the time but what I did know mm. is I need to have a conversation with him I need to ask him why has he done this to me how could he do this to me because never in a million years would I believe he would have done this to me because I knew his goal was always for us to be together 
So I would never would have believed we'd done something so severe that we couldn't come back from. And I remember asking the police first, you know, could you help me to get a meeting with him? I need to have a conversation with him. And mm. he was very defensive. No. Why would you want to do that? You do know this man tried to kill you, don't you? And I was so taken aback. And I was like, well, yes, I know that. And he was like, no, that doesn't happen in this country. The crime's too severe. The risks are too severe. That would never happen. I was like, OK. And again, I'm just really taken aback because it's the first time I'm asking about this. Still don't know the word restorative justice. Mm. So I continue to ask women's aid, victim liaison, victim support, anybody and everybody that was professional. Then started, as I went on asking these questions, realised it was called restorative justice. Mm. And every single professional that I asked, every single one said had a kind of a defensive attitude. Yeah. Is that because you want to be with him? Why would you want to see the man that tried to kill you? No, that's not going to happen. No, that's not that's not the right thing to do. No, well, it wouldn't happen anyway. There's nowhere to help you. Nothing like that in this country anyway. And I was just being shut down and shut down and shut down. Okay. Now, for me, I knew exactly what I needed. I've always been a conversationist. I've always been big on communication. And nobody could have held him accountable in the way that I could. No one could answer the questions that I had that I needed to move forward with but him. Yeah. So he'd gone not guilty at first and said that I took a knife to stab him with it and he stabbed him, me in self-defence. So I had to wait a whole year for it to get to a trial. On the first day of the trial, he admitted guilt and obviously all that was stacked against him. Every one of the witnesses was willing to be a witness and it was all stacked against him anyway. Um, and then I didn't get to go up and say what I was going to say. Now I'd been in counselling for nine months preparing for that day. Mm -hmm. And I was so full of anxiety. I was being sick outside the courtroom, ready to go in and say what I had to say. I didn't get my moment to say what I needed to say. I didn't get to look him in the face and say what I needed to say. Mm -hmm. And my victim impact statement didn't get ready mm -hmm. because he admitted guilt. So nobody got to hear what I had to say. And this crime and this harm had been caused to me. And I, I, in my head, it just made so much sense of what I was asking for, but didn't seem to make sense to anybody else. So he ended up getting 16 years that got changed two weeks later to seven years and seven months because I said they couldn't give him a life license and a life sentence so again I felt so aggrieved about that and I just thought in all of this nobody cares about how I feel what this has done to me what it is I've got to say this happened between me and him but yeah, everybody else is getting a say and I'm not getting a say so the kind of tenacious personality and determined spirit that I have anyway I was not going to give up on what I knew I needed because what had happened is I'd become the woman that had been stabbed I didn't know who I was anymore everything that I was doing I was trying to get a house trying to get a move to a new school every conversation I had to have was involving I've been stabbed I've been stabbed and I just didn't know who Janika was anymore and I felt mm. like the only way I could move forward was by having this conversation. I didn't know necessarily the power it would hold, but I just felt it in my heart that I knew what I needed. Mm. So three and a half years, nearly four years, I fought for restorative justice. No one would help me, no, not one person. And it really hurt my soul so much that not only did I have to fight for my life, I'm now having to fight for my healing. When there's all these services that are in play, victim services that are supposed to be victim led, and they're not listening to what I am telling them that I need. They're telling me that that's not right for me when I'm telling them that is what I need. So I managed to find, come across why me, thank God. Obviously, I'm in Birmingham, they was in London, just by a, a God grace chance. I used to suffer with insomnia and I didn't sleep one single night of sleep for that whole four years. I'd be up all through the night, I'd probably get two hours of sleep. And one night I had the question that kept going around. It's quite ironic, really, and funny now. But the question that kept going around in my head on the loop was, why me? Why me? Why has this happened to me? Why is no one helping me? And I must have been on my phone and put it in my phone. Why me? The question. <laughs> And then it come up with the charity and I thought you couldn't make that off. Like, it was just amazing. And then when I phoned him in the morning, I was like, <laughs> I was like hold on, calm down. I was like, you, it says you're a starting justice company. You said you're going to help me. And she's like, calm down. She's like, I can't understand what you're saying. She said, I told her my experience. She said, I am so sorry you've had that experience. She said, because it does happen. It can happen. And we will do everything in our power 
to make sure it does happen if that's what you want. But it is a process. It does take time. And I just literally felt like I had a call to heaven. That's what I felt like. Finally, somebody's listening to me. So I met with them and I proceeded to get the meeting and it was everything that I could have hoped it would be and more. It was the scariest thing that I've ever done in my life, but it was the most empowering thing I've ever done for myself. And I, but I got to the point where I, everybody said, you know, what is it you want him to say? And it was not about what he had to say. It was about what I had to say to him. He had left me dying on that tarmac as a victim. I was dying in that moment when he left me. I needed him, excuse my emotion, I needed him to see me for the victor that I was. I needed to take that power back. I needed to say it face to face. And it was just so empowering. I couldn't breathe at first as I was sitting there, overcome with emotion. And he walked in and he was even bigger than he was when he went into prison. But the shame that was he was covered and consumed in, you would have to see that with your own eyes. He couldn't even look at me for at least 15 minutes. He looked at the facilitator and he started to address the facilitator. He would not look at me. And the facilitator said, no, 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 you need to address Janika. This is her meeting. She's asked for, you've agreed, you need to address Janika. And as he turned to look at me, he had tears rolling down his face and I was just overcome with emotion that I couldn't speak. And I said, why did you do that to me? How could you do that to me? And he said, I'm so sorry for what I did. I know that's never going to be enough, but I will never forgive myself for what I did to you. It wasn't your fault. It was my fault. And I'm so sorry. Now, of course, I would have liked to hear remorse, but that's still not going to change anything and everything. It's not. It's not. But yes, I was glad I heard it. And I was glad I saw it because I wouldn't have been able to get that through a letter. You had to be there to see and feel that. So... I got to tell him that the, the impact his actions had had on me and our family, on my family, and everything that I'd had to go through, and you know the consequences of his actions and the journey that I'd had to go on, and that that this was the end. Like there is no coming back. I needed him to be clear that this is it. The consequences that is you will never see your children. We will never have another conversation after this day. That is it. And I need him to know that and be clear about that. And for me to be able to see that he knows that as well. So I didn't live with that fear. And I, at the end, I told him I had got reached a place of forgiveness for him, which again, I lost friends because of and different services could kind of got down on me about that. And again, for me, I always say to people, forgiveness is not about saying what happened is OK. It's never going to be OK. It's never going to be justifiable. It's about setting me free from all that hatred and anger and toxicity that is trying to play my heart and allowing me to move forward so I can be the best version of me and I can be the best mum that I can be. And that's what it gave me. So I told him. And in the end, um, by the end of the meeting, I, I asked if I could pray for him because I'd had, I felt like I needed to do that. And I did pray for him. And then by the end of it, because I did pray for him and I was holding these hands in my hands and just looking at them, thinking, how on earth am I holding the hands that tried to kill me? And I ended up um, hugging at the end. And it was like a closure for me. And that's what I needed. And then I came away from that meeting, had the best sleep I'd had in years. Um, and the next day I felt like a new person. And I spoke to the facilitator um, a couple of days after. And I was talking all about this future plans that I had and he was like wow did you sound so different I said my voice sounded like this last week and he said no but you really sound like you've got a new lease of life and I felt like there's never um it's never going to be a full closure because obviously I've got children and you know I've got to look at them every day I've got to have conversations with them however that allowed me to compartmentalize it put it over there and say that's it now I can I've done what I needed to do with that and I can move forward and look forward and to, to know that I was invited to a meeting with the director of YME to the West Midlands Police and Crime Commissioner's Office. So mm -hmm. they could say, you know, we're here if you need help with any complex cases. And to know there was nothing in the West Midlands really hurt my heart so much because I thought there's going to be many, many victims that want this. And to know if they are asking for it, they're, not, they're being shut down and the barriers that are being put in place is disgusting. Mm -hmm. So I sat in this meeting and David James, who was the commissioner, and he came in and was present at the meeting and he said, you know, what are we here for? And they said about why Mayor offering the services for restorative justice. 
and such better domestic violence. And he just straight out said, well, I'll tell you right now, for domestic violence, the only reason a woman would want to see the perpetrator of the violence caused against her would be because she wants to be in a relationship with him. Oh. And everybody looked around the table because he didn't know who I was. And they were like, oh. and he was like, oh, what, what's, what's the problem here? What, what's, what's going on? Have I missed something? And they're like, would you want to introduce yourself to me? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, my name is Janika Cartwright. <laughs> I was a victim of attempted murder at the hands of my partner. And it is comments, ignorant comments like that, that act as a barrier to victims getting the healing that they need. And it's not okay. And it's going to trickle down into the forces. And it's really not okay. And if you knew what the fight for my healing and fight for restorative justice done to me, it nearly, it was a fight for my healing that nearly ruined me, not actually fighting for my life. And that was what was the hardest thing for me to come to terms with. And I basically sat there and told him this whole vision that I had for West Midlands of restorative justice and how, you know, you're putting all this money into victim support, all this money into women's aid, the space for victim led. But yet when a victim is sitting in front of them, telling them what it is they need, they're shutting them down. That is not OK. Mm -hmm. Restorative justice is such a powerful tool. And for victim, victims know that they need it. They know why they need it. But encompassing trauma, they may not be able to articulate it at the time. But knowing them, hearing them say things like, I need answers, I've got questions, I need closure. Those things should be, that's restorative justice. And especially if there's then saying it out of their mouth, can you help me get restorative justice? And you're telling them, no, it's, that's not OK. And basically what happened is we came away from that meeting because he was busy and he had to go. He said, you know, thank you for your input. And went, I thought, well, I don't care what you think. I'm just going to say it as it is. And then yeah. a week later, I was invited back. He said he wanted a meeting with me. And I was thinking, oh, no. <laughs> so I came into the meeting. It was just me and him. And I went to shake his hand. He said, oh, no, can I have a hug? And he gave me a hug. And he's like, I just want to say thank you for your honesty. Thank you very much. He said, because I needed to put in my place. He said, you know, I'm, I'm 70 plus, I'm old school and I'm, I've got ignorant ways of thinking and I, I needed that. He said, I've thought about nothing else since that day. And what I am going to do now is I'm going to invest 1.4 million into a restorative justice service in the West Midlands because of that meeting, because of that vision, because it's needed and you're right. And I was so overwhelmed and it's something that I'm so honoured to have been a part of. Mm. And then I became an ambassador for them. So then it launched and there were so many different victim services that was against it. I said, no, we don't need it here. It's not for our victims. And I was furious. And I would go around with the, the director of the company that got the tender, raising awareness in the West Midlands. So I've sat in front of the director of women's aid, of victim support, of the probation. And some of them have said to me, especially women's aid being the top, it's not for our victims. I would never offer it to our victims. I said, don't you dare ever mm -hmm. address me as your victim. Because if you're going to address me as your victim, you need to be owning my scars, my PTSD, my anxiety, my nightmares, my flashbacks. Don't you dare. That's not your right. And I used to hate the word victim. And I'd get very offended if someone would call me a victim. Because I knew there was such a negative connotation attached to victim. And it was as if, if you're a victim, you can't think for yourself, you can't speak for yourself, you don't know what you want. And obviously that's not what it means. And that now they've been in play for a year and a half. And in the first nine months, even... Janika, you've gone on to mute. <laughs> sorry, yeah. yeah Although they right. said it was a waste of time, waste of money, no one's going to need it, no one's going to use it here. In the first nine months, they did 100 face-to-face -face conferences with 100% satisfaction rate of, from victims and from offenders, seeing changes in offenders. And it just blesses my heart so much to be a part of. And what I wanted to say, I know we're going over time now, so what I wanted to say regarding youth offend, um, offending teams, because yeah. I've trained some of the youth offending teams as well. And what I love is... To me, it's about education. It's about being honest. If you don't know what you don't know, and you know, this is where education is needed. And some of them have been honest and transparent enough to say that one youth offending officer says to me, you know, I've never actually thought of the victims. I know that sounds awful, but my focus is on 
the offender and trying to help them be rehabilitated and you know seeing what it why it was the what caused them to um commit this harm but never thinking of the harmed never ever thinking mm. of the harmed and that's something i need to think about another one had said to me probation officer had said to me you know that they'd had an offender say to them they wanted restorative justice and she said and i'm embarrassed to say i shut them down and said no that wouldn't be helpful it wouldn't be helpful to the victim it definitely wouldn't be helpful to you and i was so shocked it was good for me to get the knowledge what is out there because this is mm -hmm. what needs changing but my thing is especially with youth and definitely with the youth yeah. adults is different but with the youth my thing has always been behind every action is a reason but most of the time people focus on the action don't focus on the reason now i understand if the action is so severe you have to do a big focus on the action but if you're never focusing on the reason how is change ever going to happen what led them to commit that crime and the empathy is missing so much from the youth of today from a lot of adults and to me, restorative justice brings that to the forefront, the empathy to the forefront. And if they can really focus on that, if you can focus on the empathy and what is it that, you know, makes, if you look at how that affects other people, how your actions affect other people, that is going to be a catalyst for them to think about not offending again and not causing harm to others. And another thing is that I've just got wrote down here, sorry, is how, yes, holding them accountable. Offenders yeah. a lot of the time are never really held accountable for their actions. Yes, they have to be punished by the criminal justice system, but no one can hold an offender accountable in the way that the victim can. Nobody can. And for them, if an offender then is asking for it even more so, never, ever, ever, please, and I hope no one here ever would shut them down because that yeah. to me says a lot about their desire for change because it takes courage and I will say that even from an offender, it takes courage and bravery to face up to the person who you have harmed. And I've met with offenders also. And offenders have said to me, the burg burglars or people that have, you know, um, really gone into harming people, mugging people, and the worst end of it as well. I said, the burglars especially, have said, I've never once thought that that's mm. causing harm to anyone because they're insured. So I don't see how that's causing harm. And sitting down with that person who, of course, harmed to made me realise actually there's a person, there's a family behind this house. Mm -hmm. It's not just about their their um, cherished items being replaced. It's about how do they feel after this? They don't feel safe in their own homes. They've got trust issues and the trauma that it causes. So I hope that you've took something from what I've said, and I hope that you just know that change can happen and I truly believe that restorative justice I will always be speaking of it forever and I will truly believe it's one of the most powerful tools for the harmed and the harmers to be able to move forward to be able to change to be able to think different look act different live different and live a better life and I really hope that this has been positive for you all listening to my story and thank you for listening yes. thank you very much Janika. Uh, my name's Margaret Cassidy. I'm from the Youth Offending Service, and I want to say thank you very much for sharing your story. Oh, thank um, you. I've been a restorative practitioner now for 20 years, and if I'd have known about your story, if your case, I would have taken on your case. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you very much. That means a I, lot. Thank you. Yeah, and you saying what you said about young people. Um, we have a lot of young people that come through with relationships that are breaking down and with young people, they think that they can treat their other partners in the way like dirt, really. And we have discussed this at the Youth Offending Service and a lot of people have been against it. And, do you know, it would be lovely if you could give a talk at Birmingham Youth Offending Team. I would definitely do that. Have you, see, have you been to Birmingham? Yeah, Did I've done, to, no, I've done some with the Wolverhampton um, Offending Team, not Birmingham yet. Right. Birmingham is massive. And we have five restorative practitioners. And we are fighting the culture that you came across wow, and 
Yeah. And if you could help us to move this forwards, I would really appreciate it. Oh, we'll definitely do that. That's what I live for. I said if I got caught now, I think my stars of justice would come singing out of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Honestly. So, yes, if right. I could get my details, yeah, maybe thank off you. Ben. Yes, thank please. you so much, Janika, and thanks very much, Margaret. Yeah, of course, I'll, I'll make sure you. I can put you in touch. And, thank and you. yeah, I've heard. Yeah, I mean, I've heard. Obviously, I've I've known Janika since I started working at Wami, and I've heard Janika speak many times. And every time, I feel like I've been sort of hit by a truck. You know, yes. it's that sort of emotional whirlwind, and it's really, it's really a testament, Janika, not only to your strength and character, but your sort of continued uh, drive that comes off you. And there's not a lot of people who you know, working in, in policy and as I do, you know, then communications, I know that there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of times that you speak to a policing crime commissioner for whatever period of time you did and, and walk out with 1.4 million for restorative <laughs> justice services. So it's a testament to sort of the huge, huge ripple effect that not only Janika, but that people with lived experience of these sorts of situations can bring to conversations that they're too often excluded from so a huge huge thank you as always Janika I'm sure I can tell as always that everyone's very hanging on hanging on Janika's every word I wanted to very give us just sense. yeah I wanted to give us just a few minutes for people if you want to comment in the chat or put your hands up if you wanted to say anything and I'll take you in turns to see if you have any questions for Janika or anything else you wanted to ask her before we have a quick round off chat about what about you know what we might what might have come from that so I'll just look through the I'll quickly just look through the the comments um, once I can change that out of my screen. Oh, I'm just looking at them now. Thank you, everybody, so much for your lovely comments and kind words. It really means a lot. And I just yeah. feel like somebody has to speak up because it's not okay. And I'm not going to just lie down and, and have it okay. said that it is okay to speak on behalf of people that are able to speak for themselves and you know there's this little box that it doesn't fit in that box or your toolbox yeah. and we don't know what to do listen absolutely. that's the first thing just listen <laughs> absolutely and I think I'll just quickly go I mean obviously read through and people saying Janine could be an inspiration and a powerful testimony and thanks for sharing your yeah. experience and being proud and and that's everyone's sort of everyone's reflections yeah, yeah. and Demi yeah. asking about Janika sharing your details so uh Janika would you I don't know if you I could send an email follow up to the youth justice people who are here are you yeah. would you like me to put Linda's details so that she can help help sort of sieve it I know that Janika is a busy person and, and has <laughs> had, you know does... I, I could put my email address that's absolutely fine okay it? yeah so I, I'll send a follow-up email then to the group and I'll put your email address and obviously does everyone keep in mind that obviously Janika's not amazing yeah. as she is she's not a full-time ambassador for me and she's mother with three and studying and got all sorts going on <laughs> but, oh, no, she's a, yeah, an inspiration um and people saying we've got the access to the video and share i'm recording it so I, I always would circulate the link just wanted to check with janika your are you okay for people to share yeah video if absolutely help, i always say if it will help one person or help transform the mind of one person then i'm happy yeah fantastic so, thank you so janika, I'll, I'll... do you mind me using it at a team meeting Pardon? Do you mind me using this as a team meeting? Oh, no, not at all. No, that's fine. Thank Fantastic. you. So I just wanted to check if anyone else has any any questions they'd like to ask Janika, just put your hands up or just comment question in the chat and I'll leave it sort of for 15 seconds uh, to wait. I'm so sorry, I can't write anything in. I don't know how to use. No worries. That's okay, Margaret. Just, yeah. Sorry. Just hold fire one second. Thank you yeah i think we've largely been left with with stunned silence so thank you so much janika and i think the next we've got 20 more minutes and because you know it's always absolutely incredible and we can think about all the amazing things we've learned from it and i and it gives you the huge motivation i'm sure you all have your own stories of what motivates you to be in rest about restorative justice and, and i know that janika's top of top of my list and i i, I one of the things that I think we can think from this is okay so what 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 could we take from this going forward in in terms of one of the areas that I've really reflected on since working in the youth space especially is the importance of thinking about restorative justice post sentence for people who are serving time in prison and not and I know that I've worked in a lot of cases where there's a lot of focus on restorative justice very admirably as part of a wider diversion 
as part of an out-of-court disposal, uh, you know, because you're thinking, oh, this is a young person who, as part of their rehabilitation, but to also really remember the processes post-sentence and how the victim or survivor is included in that. So I'm just going to open it up for, for a bit of a conversation on that point. So moving away specifically from Janika, just about in your services and in general, what is the best, what do you think is the best practice in terms of making sure that every victim of crime is able to access restorative services if they want to for cases where there's been a conviction and someone's gone to prison and it's gone through court? Um, I don't know if anyone has any initial thoughts about how it works in your areas regarding post-sentence restorative justice. Uh, we go into three victims pre-sentence as mm. well as post-sentence mm. and every victim is offered restorative justice whatever the crime mm. and we don't get many victims come forward to take up the offer of restorative justice mm. and what we're looking for is ways of engaging victims uh, so as they know that they have this choice. I know we've got the victim's charter and the victim's code of practice, um, but what we're looking at is another way of engaging people so that mm. they do have to say, is it the right time? Is it too early? Is it too late? And that's what we're working on at the moment. Thanks very much, Margaret. That's really interesting feedback. Thank you. I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts about how you engage uh, in a post-sentence uh, context? It, it, does it tend to be, who leads that, thinking purely process-wise, back to boring process? Who is it in your areas who, who would be responsible for having that conversation with, with victims of crime for post-sentence, RJ, if, if anyone? Oh, I would be. You would be, Margaret. For any, anyone else? Has anyone else got a view it depends, in there? It depends how long the uh, sentence is for, because if it's for a long, if it's for over a year, I think it is, we, we refer it to the victim liaison officer at uh, probation. Mm. So they take it up from there, from post-sentence, yeah. Oh, I see. So we go to a victim, victim liaison officer. Mm. That's interesting. And would this be so... And then they don't offer RJ. Well, well, one sec, Margaret, one sec. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that's 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 what the process is, certainly in London, as far as I'm aware. That yeah. You, you, if it's over, if it's a sentence for over a year, then in it, because I think they then will be involved if when the young person is, is going to come out of prison, they'll be involved in the parole and all that kind of thing, I guess. That's interesting to hear that process. Um, yeah. Nikki? Hi, um, in, with, I'm with um, Wales Probation Services Restorative Justice Team and I think we have quite a unique um, setup really. We have a contract with David Powers um, Police Crime Commissioner so they refer victims directly to us um, but we also have, we worked long and hard to continue developing relationships with the victim liaison officers within probation. Mm. And even though we are at the moment, um, you know, we're, we're about to be reunified with probation now. We were in the private sector for some time and we, we definitely struggled for a while to sort of um, build those relationships. So it's more of a personal networking. So we do have some VLOs with, within Wales who will automatically, you know, think about restorative justice for the victims and suggest, you know, arranging a meeting to just purely so I can hear more about it firsthand from a facilitator. Um, but hopefully, yeah, once we're reunified with the probation service, it will be a different picture for us. Um, and, you know, it's, it, I just can't bang on enough about it, really. And that's why in my comments I said, you know, um, so you could just listen to you speak today. I really think, you know, there are so many people within the probation service that know very little about restorative justice and we are one of their services. So for me and my team, it's always a battle really trying to sort of inform and enlighten people about the benefits of this, you know, just so we can sort of generate referrals from the perpetrators as well as from victims. So thank you very much for, your, for allowing us to hear your story, very powerful. Thank you very much, thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much, Nikki. Now, Mr. Westsea. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Andrew. Um, B. Um, yeah, it's a, a fantastic story, Janika. Thank you so, so much. And story is not really the right word, it's testimony. Yeah. Um, at Luton Yoss, and I guess maybe it's similar for a lot of other youth funding services, as part of post sentence restorative mm -hmm. process, 
is very much guided by actually the young person who's on the order. Because if somebody's on a referral order for four months and we can only do the work for four months, now we do, wherever possible, we, we will extend that as much as we can. But technically, the, 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 the restorative work should stop when the young person is no longer open to youth offending service, which is, is far from anything of giving victim satisfaction. And my main concern around all that, amongst many other things, is the fact that the, the offender, the perpetrator, is still in control. Uh, or uh, you know, not sort of directly in their own terms, but basically any work that's done is still done on their terms in terms of, uh, of how long they're open to us for. And I think just being able to set, you know, get MOJ, et cetera, saying that, yeah, no, you know, this takes as long as it does. And if, it, if that young person's open to you for four months, but the victim work goes on beyond that, then that counts uh, as, as part of the counting rules because obviously ultimately that's what it comes down to um uh, which is you know it's shocking uh, and again it just it just concerns me that we're taking away we, we're, we're trying restorative work are trying to empower victims and the system is still taking it away from them. i think that's a really powerful point and i think that it's you know Janika always reminded to me of how how dangerous it is for people to be making judgments on other people's behalf especially groups like you know groups like women's aid we know they do lots of very important work i don't want to make it specifically about them but group you know groups who who are working pure obviously they go into work wanting to help people who are harmed and wanting to help women who are harmed but if you're not careful and if you make any assumptions and if you speak for people you can end up having the opposite effect i just wanted to to read through uh some of the comments i mean phil talked about how he'd how he'd heard of Janika's statement about her fighting for her right for healing, but hearing of it firsthand, really like to commend her for, for how far she fought. And Cheryl's reflection, it's interesting, saying that RJ practitioners lead on all RJ initially, so I'm assuming that means post-sentence or pre-sentence or at any stage. Um, and then uh, comments from Luton we've just heard as well. And then Janika was passing on a huge heartfelt thank you to everyone that commented and also for your contribution to a story of justice, which means a lot to her and which she knows will make a big difference in ensuring positive change in the future. And together, I believe we will all help to make the world a better place, despite the barriers that ignorant people try to put in our place. Mm. So yes, I would, I would agree that. And Margaret also saying, thank you so much. We are restricted, but we do try and make it victim led. But in youth justice, there's a focus on the offender. And I wondered if this was something else to discuss is about that familiar question of how, how one makes the offer to a victim of crime. And especially in a serious crime, if anyone has any thoughts about the best way, so if you were dealing with a case, which is a very serious case, doesn't necessarily have to be sexual assault, domestic violence, but other very, <coughs> any very serious crime. Does anyone have any sort of ideas or thoughts about how to sensitively and appropriately raise restorative justice or how to sort of follow up on things they say to raise restorative justice? Ben, can I just come in there? Let's Phil, yeah. Um, I think you know, we, we talked previously, Ben, and one of the things I found uh, being new into a start of justice, I mean, I've only been doing this for a year uh, myself, um, is just the awareness for, for victims, for the general public, as a restart of justice isn't there. And that's one of the things that we, you know, like you and I talked about previously, about making it more aware to, to, the, to the people so they know, you know, we've got the victim's code. But unless you be, like you say become involved in in offence, it should become de general daily practice. So mm. start of justice should be on on display. You know it should be advertised as much as we you know we talk about cars on TV. It should be giving this people you know people the opportunity and and the right to engage. Just, you know so they can make their own choice on it. And I think that's where you know we need to sort of move forward with it. No, absolutely. I completely agree, Phil. I think mm. that sums it up well. There's, I've got a Andrea first and then Gwen. Sorry, my mic's up in the air. Um, I was just going to, I was just going to say, um, I'm from West Mercia and I work for Victim Support and I'm a restorative justice area coordinator. Um, and in our area, we've been working really, really hard um, to get RJ champions from police, magistrates, um, domestic abuse um, providers, sexual assault providers, all sorts of different people. And we've, we've got about 30 
um, RJ champions now. We hold meetings every three months and engage. Um, and it, it seems to be working really, really well. Mm. Great. That's great to hear that, that as well. And wonderful. I think, can I ask about the RJ champions and what they're, are these people who have experienced RJ or is it a mixture? It's a, it's a good mixture, but what we're doing now moving forward, because we're just trying to raise awareness of restorative justice and every every like week I'm thinking, oh, we need to try this and we need to try this. So what we're doing now is we're working with um, <clears throat> the victim advice line, the witness care units, the victim support workers. So any victim that has a known offender, we've put together an email and one of our leaflets for them to be sent out so that people are being made aware of restorative justice and then able to make their own decision of whether they want to come into service and find out more about it. Mm. So we're actually to, uh, actually trying to pilot that at the moment as well. It's definitely something which is held back more by people's ignorance and people's opposition, because I know that in my experience, speaking about restorative justice to everyone left, right and centre, I don't tend to get, that's a terrible idea. I tend to get people don't really understand. And then maybe a bit later they go, oh yeah, it does sound good. Yeah, well, I, I, spoke, so, yeah. I spoke to somebody yesterday about a case that they're working on and we had a chat about it and his opinion on it was, no, it's not right for this person. Yeah. And I was just like, hold on a minute. <laughs> and, you know, kind, kind of had a really good conversation with this person, but that's what you come up against people's own oh. opinions on things, which prevents the, the word getting across to, yeah. to, to victims of crime. I will also say, though, also my thing with leaflets, this is my personal thing, leaflets, mm. emails, I'm not saying don't use them because obviously they're a form of getting the message out there, but I didn't realise until I started going around these services and training these services, victim support especially, that it was mm. actually in the Victims Code of Practice that you have to be an offer of RJ, but what yeah. they get away with so often is, well, we gave a leaflet, Oh, the amount of paperwork that I had, not once did I ever read through any leaflet. And yeah. the problem is with a victim, is you've got to understand, if a victim has been harmed in any way, it doesn't have to be the, my end. Harm is harm. And the way that it affects your brain, trauma, the way that it affects your brain, it really can be debilitating. And when you've got to deal with so much of rebuilding your life, the last thing you're going to do is read a leaflet I'm telling you that for sure and then if you do look over that leaflet or that email if you have never heard of restorative justice it will literally go over your head because it means nothing to you so this is why for me when there's an offer of restorative justice it's there's a lot of nervousness and there's a lot of fear around offering restorative justice which I appreciate and that's why there's more education needed more training needed but there has to be a conversation and, and ensure, ensuring that the person you're offering it to, being the victim, understands what it is that is on offer. It's all right to say, OK, well, you can have restorative justice and, you know, well, what, what does that mean? What, what, I don't understand what that even means. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that's a real big thing that I just think needs to be taken into consideration and being purposeful about making the offer and not being fearful about it because the person either will want it or they won't want it. And one thing I that's very, very true. And one thing that I would add to that, and the one thing we focus on why me a lot is it's really important how how organizations, youth training teams use their data. Mm -hmm. So for things like this, it's like have a it's good to try to incorporate in reviews or however it's done, you know, have we actually heard of a look at our RJ cases? Have we asked people where they heard of it? Has anyone actually come forward and said, I read about this on this leaflet? <laughs> I want this. If no one ever has, then that then you can be presented to, to decision makers, etc., and just say, okay, well, and make it data led. Because this is what we often find when we go into work with areas is when you look behind the data, you'll find certain things that everyone probably could have guessed. But when you see it laid out and you think, okay, no one has come forward saying I read this and I want yeah. this in, in three years. That's yeah. sort of a view to review. But of course, there's a million other challenges as well, and I appreciate that. Um, Gwen. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I was trying to put my um, video in. I can't see how to do that. Oh, there we are down at the bottom. Okay. Uh, now we can see you. Hello. Hello. <laughs> A few uh, conversations ago, you were talking about what encourages victims to get involved. And um, I know I've been a counsellor at RJO role, but um, the skills that I have 
in that have been obviously massively useful. So when I go and see somebody or I talk to a victim for the first time, it's not about me, it's not about what I want, it's not about my agenda. So I'm just going there in the first instance to make a relationship and to talk to somebody about their experiences. And one of the things that really struck me about Janika was that she knew what she wanted. She flipping knew right from the start. And, and people know, we need to trust that people know what they need. Obviously we need to make it safe. Obviously there are all sorts of processes and things to put in place, relationship. And I think, I think if, if we focus on that, we can't go far wrong. It's about, it's about the person harmed and the, and the young person's agenda. It's about what they will do. And it can be any shape it likes. I love to go and talk to people about this, um, knowing that I don't have to make it a shape. It's not about me making an offer about any specific thing. And I try not to use the word restorative justice, except maybe once. And I try not to use the word conference, because what does that mean? And what does that mean to a young person? So relationships and language, I'd say, are really key. So such a good point Gwen and I, I, I mean clearly those interpersonal skills are so important and obviously it's something that restorative justice workers tend to have but that sort of listening to what someone wants and really listening and then leading from there I think it's a really really good point um Teresa is that sort of half a hand uh, yeah that is, I haven't got a raising hand um Janika thank you so much uh, for your testimony I was overwhelmed listening to you and I really feel like reignited passion for RJ we're gonna fight the fight with you we will not give up um, but I'm in the Youth Offending Service in London as well. And just to kind of add and echo all everybody's points, um, I had a quite interesting request from our newly formed gangs unit um, just recently. And they have asked whether we could um, help them write um, a very personal card um, to usually young people who are, are victims of um, stabbings and, and worse. Um, and they kind of thought they want to reach out and show that they feel empathy and they would share sort of an offer kind of any support, but it was just that sort of point of reaching out and opening the doors and leaving mm -hmm. them to often young people and their families to respond to that. But they just felt that writing a card, not the kind of standard mm -hmm. metropolitan police, you know, you've been victim of crime on the date, so and so, personal, very personal card. So it, kind of myself and uh, our systemic practitioner literally just had a meeting two weeks ago and beginning to kind of put that card together where as a service we express we're so sorry that this has happened to you we cannot imagine what it's like but we are here for you in any shape and form and kind of let us know what we can do and possibly some sort of structure of what we can possibly offer but it was just the, the essence of I've never seen such a sort of personal reaching out from a, a service which is so process driven and so assessment risk you know victims are taken very seriously if there is evidence of further risk you know then strap meetings will be called you know i've been in strap meetings and risk panels every day you know every day of the last week because of this sort of victims have to me um so suddenly victims are really important but if victim is peaceful it just wants rj people are like yeah you know it's it's not taken so seriously but anyway, I just thought this is a new idea and it came from came from our gangs unit, a very personal card. And they've spoken to a few young people and young people kind of really felt that card is something they will take look at because they don't receive cards very often. Um, so I'm, I'll let you know how, how it will go. We, we're planning to have another meeting to just kind of make the card, put the card together and um, hopefully begin to use it with young people. So I'll update you how it goes. <laughs> It's a really excellent idea, Teresa, and it's getting a lot of love in the chat. And I think that's definitely the little personal touches that break through the system. Because I think it's easy to forget, you know, how many, oh, I'm I'm this from this service, I'm that from them, I'm you know, and people get a bit overwhelmed. And I think it's a really, really good observation. But um, I would say as well, there's a person behind the crime and there's a person behind the harm. Mm. And they both need to be looked at. They both need support in some way. And yes, you know, my focus is obviously victims and women and young girls, but somebody needs to be working with the offenders, definitely. And it's another really interesting, we're about to be out of time, but I just wanted to cover a really interesting comment from Claire saying that they contact all victims and always discuss and offer RJ, although, of course, with the caveat that conferences need consent from both parties, of course, but sometimes find that some of their YOS officers can be the barrier for this happening not necessarily the the offender. I don't know if you wanted to have a last word on this, Claire. Uh, 
Well, no, no, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, I do, it, it, it gets, we, me and Hayley, my colleagues, get really, really frustrated because we can see, we, we're lucky in the youth vending service that we see both sides of the story mm. and you can see that there can be some healing done there and we get really frustrated that case managers kind of shut you down before you've even started. Not all of them, they're not all like that. We've had some really successful conferences, but it's so frustrating as a practitioner to be, you know, shut off at the start of a journey. You know, we kick back as much as we can, mm -hmm. but you know, there's, there's only so much we can do, but it, it's, it's, I mean, Janika, you're fantastic. I think you're brilliant and what a great experience, very inspirational. I agree with my colleagues here, but mm. yeah, from, from our point of view, it is frustrating. It's great, great to hear. We're all we're all trying. <laughs> Thanks so much for that, Claire. And uh, and yeah, there's some agreement from that as well from from Norfolk and from Luton. All right, look, it's uh, I think it's lunchtime. Uh, Janika, thank you so so much again. We always really appreciate your input, and everyone's always very touched by what you say and by the the change you've made. So you can hopefully go with a with a skip in the steps the rest of your day. And I'm sure you, I'm sure you might feel a bit oh sometimes after uh sharing these things but it's incredibly appreciated thank you everyone yeah so thank everyone you. thank you Janika. thank you i'm going to thank turn you. off the recording now uh thank you.